All right, this is another example where we will find the trigonometric Fourier series and actually the compact trigonometric Fourier series for a periodic continuous time signal. The continuous time signal we'll work with here is this signal x of t, so it's kind of this sawtooth up-down triangle waveform. It has an amplitude of plus minus a, so those are the extremes that it achieves in terms of amplitude. And then the time markings here, it goes up and down, values of one, so every one second it, or uh, I'm sorry, every two seconds, it has repeated itself. So here on the upslope, it gets repeated over here. So this has a period of two. So knowing that it has a period of two, and knowing that this is an odd function, we'll be able to evaluate our equations for the trigonometric Fourier series coefficients. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Due to the odd symmetry, this, this problem is a little bit different than the last one we worked. The last one we worked, we had even symmetry. When we had even symmetry, the Bn's went away, and all we had to do was compute the An's. This problem's opposite. X of t has odd symmetry. Since we have odd symmetry, all we want to represent it with are odd signals, which are sinusoids. We don't want any cosines in our representation because cosines are even functions. So that means all the coefficients of cosines have to go away, which means a0 and an have to be equal to zero due to us working with an odd signal. So that means all we need to do to compute our trigonometric Fourier series is to compute the bn's. So that makes things a little easier. As I noted before, this is a periodic signal with period two. So when we do our trigonometric Fourier series representation, let's use a time interval or time width of two so that we can perfectly represent this signal for all time. If T naught is equal to two, that means omega naught, the fundamental frequency is two pi over T naught, which is two pi over two. The twos cancel, and that means our fundamental frequency is pi radians per second. So that's the fundamental frequency that we will use here. All right, let's compute Bn. In general, we have a, an equation for Bn that is 2 over t naught, the integral over some region of width t naught, x of t times sine. But because this is an odd signal, we can use this special form of that equation. This equation says don't integrate over an interval of width t naught, only integrate over half of it. So this is an integral over half of it, but then multiply by 2 out front. So this equation right here is only good and applicable to odd signals. And we just need to evaluate this signal for this sign or this uh, equation, this integral for the signal that we have. So let's go ahead and do that. So t naught is equal to two, so that's four over two. When I do my integral, I'm allowed to choose any interval of width t naught over two. So originally I wrote it as zero to t naught over two, but I'm allowed to shift that around to any interval of width t naught over two. So I actually shifted it to the left just a little bit. The limits on my integral are still minus t naught over four to t naught over four. That's still a width of t naught over two, but I've aligned things to make my calculus just a little bit easier. So that's one trick right here. Choosing those limits to make yourself have an easier integral to work is often part of the uh, kind of skill involved in evaluating this integral. T naught in our problem is two, so two over four, these turn into one halves. The four over two out front turns into a two. On the time interval, minus a half to one half, we have to know what x of t is. If I look up at my signal here, that's just a line, and that line has a slope of two a. It's rise over run, it goes up two a in one unit of time. So we can represent this line as the equation two a t. So that's exactly what x of t is equal to on the time interval minus a half to half. We have to multiply by sine and then integrate. All right, so what happens? I can pull out the 2a out front. So 2a times 2 is 4a. And then I'm left with this integral that I need to work. So at this point, usually in this class, we have an integral to evaluate. We go to our table lookup for integrals and we find something that is very applicable. We have this integral up here at the top it says that the integral of x sine ax is one over a squared sine of ax minus ax cosine ax. So we can use that directly here to evaluate this integral. We don't have to do parts or anything like that. We'll just use a table lookup to solve the integral. For our particular integral, a is whatever is multiplying the, the variable of integration. Our variable of integration is t, so the quantity multiplying t is n pi, so that is the a that we'll use in this identity right here. 
So let's go ahead and use that. I'm going to get 4a over a squared is n squared a pi squared. And then I need to evaluate this sine of ax is sine of n pi t minus at, so n pi t, times cosine of n pi t. Might have said that a little wrong. A is n pi, so it's n pi times cosine of n pi t, and then we need to evaluate this at a half and minus half. So continuing the calculus, 4 pi over n squared pi squared, I need to evaluate it at a half, that's what this is, minus evaluated at a negative a half. So that is what this parentheses term is here. So a lot of terms we need to th work through, but it's not too bad. If we look at this term right here, that term right there, sine of minus x is minus sine of x. So I can rewrite that as minus sine of positive n pi over t. So I can write that like this. And this term right here, cosine of minus x is just cosine of x. So that's just cosine of n pi over 2. The reason I did that is because I want these to match these so I can combine them. And that's what I'm going to do next. Essentially what I have here is there's a sine term minus a minus of the same sine term. So those are going to add. And then this term right here is going to cancel with that term right there. So if we do our algebra, what we're left with is 2 times 4a over n squared pi squared sine, because I had two of those sines and the cosine terms canceled out. So I found that bn is equal to 8a over n squared pi squared sine of n pi over 2. That's a great equation. We can just leave it at that. If we want to, we can think through the possible values of sine of n pi over 2. Anytime n is even, we have sine of pi, so that's going to be 0. Anytime that n is 1, 5, 9, etc., sine of n pi over 2 is 1, and we just have 8a over n squared pi squared. So this is the case when that's 1. The other case is when this is negative 1, and we would end up with minus 8a over n squared pi squared, and that happens anytime n is 3, 7, 11, etc. So you can just leave it like this if you want, but if you want to think about it as there's only so many values the sinusoid takes on, it's either 0, 1, or minus 1, you can write it as this piecewise equation. All right, so we have figured out how to represent x of t in its trigonometric Fourier series representation. This is the general equation that we have for the TFS. We know that a0 and b, or a0 and ans are 0, so for this particular problem, it collapses to this. We've solved for bn. bn is 8a over n squared pi squared sine of n pi over 2. So if I want to, I can just kind of write this out in terms of the, the terms in this infinite sum. I can't write them all out, but we can write out the n equals 1, the n equals 3, the n equals 5. Remember, because the, the n equals even terms are all 0. We can write out a few of these first terms, and obviously it goes on for forever. So you can either represent it as this compact equation or write out the first few terms of the infinite sum. What about the compact trigonometric Fourier series? We know how to write the compact trigonometric Fourier series. We write it in terms of c's and cosines with phases. We know that c0 is always equal to a0, which in this case is 0, so that's pretty easy. The equation for cn is the root sum squared of ans and bns. ans are 0, so that leaves us with the square root of bn squared, which is just the magnitude of bn. So if we look up here, the magnitude, just get rid of the negative sign. So cn is always this number. And you can kind of see that here, right? Here is 8a pi squared, and ten, then times a 1 over 5 squared there. Right? So we can kind of see it in that equation. The problem is these are sines, and they need to be cosines. So we'll talk about that here in just a minute. The other thing that we can do is compute theta n. Theta n is always equal to this equation. For our particular case, we have an equation for bn's. We know that the an's are always 0. So we're always going to have some number divided by 0. If the number on the numerator is, um, if bn is a positive quantity, a negative of a positive is negative, we'd have a negative over 0 or minus infinity. If bn is negative, negative, negative is positive, we'd have a positive number divided by zero, we get infinity. So this quantity here is always going to be the tan inverse of positive infinity or negative infinity or tan inverse of nothing. So for the even terms, we get nothing. For 
1, 5, and 9, we get minus pi over 2. And for n equals 3, 7, and 11, we get pi over 2. With this row corresponding to tan inverse of minus infinity, and this row corresponding to tan inverse of positive infinity. So this is one way to get the compact trigonometric Fourier series representation is given the a's and the b's, you just plug into the equations to figure out what the c's and the thetas are. The other way to work it is to take this representation and do a little trig and convert it into cosines with phases. So let's do that. So first let me just rewrite what we have in terms of our trigonometric Fourier series representation. And then let's note a very useful trig identity that we can use to transform these sinusoids into cosines. Plus minus sine of kt is cosine of kt minus plus pi over 2. So we can use this trig identity to convert all of our sines in this expression into cosines. So let's do that. So the beginning part doesn't change. Sine, positive sine of kt is cosine kt minus pi over 2. So here the k is pi, so I've replaced that. I started off with a positive sign, so I need to have a minus pi over 2 phase for this cosine. What about the next term? The next term, I have a negative sign, so I can turn that into a positive cosine with a positive pi over 2 phase. That's what this identity says. If I have negative cosine, then I have positive pi over 2. So I've transformed that. The next term, we do the same thing, something very similar. And there's one by one, we use this trig identity to replace sines with cosines. And all these cosines now have positive amplitudes. So 8a pi squared times 1 ninth is, by definition, c3. And 8a over pi squared times 1 over 25 is, by definition, c5. So you can just pick off the c values. Here they are with obviously this scale factor on top of them. And then also you can look at the phases to figure out what the theta ends are. So there's theta one, there's theta three, there's theta five. There is no theta four term here, right? There's no n equals four term. So theta four is zero. Okay. So that is the other approach to going from the trigonometric Fourier series representation to the compact trigonometric Fourier series representation is just do a term by term trig identity transformation to force it to have a form of a cosine with a positive amplitude and some phase. And then you can just pick off the C ends and theta ends.